So in this cannon problem, uh, the fact that you drop a rock and it takes three seconds means you know the time of flight. And because it's a cannon that shoots horizontally, the time of flight will be the same because the falling of the cannonball is the falling of the cannonball under that constant acceleration, which will take the same amount of time, three seconds. And if it only has to go 300 meters range horizontally in that same time of flight, then it's a simple first zeroth law computation. All right, the next problem. Target range, preparing to shoot a new rifle. Encourage you'd like to know how fast the bullet leaves the gun. And so I uh, put this problem in here for a couple reasons. One, it's people really do this. And two, the physics of this is quite material for an ongoing uh, political uh, unrest that we have about firearms in this country. And so uh, there are some firearms that uh, are massively more deadly than others, such as an AR-15. Um, it's going about 3,000 feet per second, which is easily double the speed of almost any other uh, gun, especially pistols and whatnot. Uh, they were made initially for military application because they will go through a helmet and scramble brains. And so it is odd that we think anyone uh, should have a gun like that. I mean, I would love to have a gun like that. I have a lot of guns, but I ought to have a lot more training uh, than what I have before I have a gun like that. It doesn't make any sense. It's too easy to get one. Um, I could order one and go pick it up. It's that simple. So uh, knowing why one gun is more or less dangerous than another gun, that rarely enters the conversation. That is a heated, complicated one because it's missing data and it's missing some physics, if you will. Uh, and so it's a good problem in that regard because it actually addresses um, real problems. It's not just that we want to report on our website how fast the bullet goes from some gun. We need to know how fast it goes because we can later on in the course even compute, you know, how much force does a bullet like that deliver to, you know, a block or, or something uh, and whatnot. And then we can make decisions about uh, how dangerous one gun is versus another one and have a data-driven decision about how we manage something like firearms uh, relative to our constitutional rights and blah, blah, blah. So it's a good reason to have the problem, now the physics. So I just want to remind you, and this should be something that is, you've seen in notes, that the height of an object, I just said it, if I have something and I let it go, if I know how long it took for it to go some distance, the height h, then I uh, could compute that height h. If I knew the distance h, I could use that to compute the time of flight, one or the other. g is a constant, half is a constant. If you know h, you get t. If you know t, you get h. So this is the simple problem. In this case, we know that uh, you find that your bullet hits nine inches below where you aimed. So H is nine inches. Now you want to be careful though, because you're dealing with inches and feet. So you're gonna need compatible units. So the question I think, there's actually a question in the blackboard part. It says, you know, what was the uh, speed I think of this uh, bullet? Um, I didn't, it's not on this page, but it's in the, the blackboard thing. So you'd want to put everything in feet, convert inches to feet. It's not hard, 12 inches per foot, and you're in business. So just knowing what you could get the time of flight from this, because you know H was nine, all right? The next thing, well, we know time of flight, and we know that speed, first zeroth law, would be delta X delta T and target which is 300 feet away. So it seems to me you could go straight to that with relative ease in this problem, provided you have uh, compatible units, all right? 
So, I'll leave that one to you. Now this is the problem. Oh, it looks like my numbering skipped. Oh, I got two number fours. This is really number three, but I've it got uh, the numbering. Just notice that. So this is number three. Uh, all right, so this is the one that is more tedious than the others. So this one's harder in the sense that there's more to do before you get to the easy part, all right? So first thing we wanna do with this problem, uh, impact angle analysis. And this is one of those problems where I don't get to use the triangle because the, the displacement triangle isn't suited for this kind of problem. So we have to start at the end of this. So people shooting an arrow, it goes and it hits, the arrow strikes the ground at an angle of 86 degrees from the vertical, 100 feet from the archer. Okay, so we can kind of draw a picture here. And we don't know what angle it's shot at, nor do we know uh, what that initial velocity is. That's just sort of a bit of a mystery. But then we find out that it hits the ground and it's at an angle, and I'm just gonna, I'm not gonna try to um, keep it to scale, but it said that it was some angle from the vertical, degrees from the vertical, all right? And so this, so here's a nice thing about this problem. It's an arrow that strikes uh, at some angle, okay? And I have a vector, that would be a final velocity vector, which I like to, which we use as arrows. So there's a, an arrow in reality, physical reality, and an arrow in mathematical reality. And since this is a, a final velocity vector here, that means it has an x part, and it has a y part. Now the strange thing here is that now its components, normally x is horizontal and its component is cosine, y is vertical and its component is sine, but not in this case on the other side because things have been flipped. Notice that this y component is adjacent to the angle. That means that it's going to be v cosine theta and x is opposite that angle, so it's gonna be v sine theta. So things have got uh, shifted around for us. This would be, you know, say an x equals zero, forgot to put this in here, and this is r is I think 100 for this uh, problem. So at this point, we've, we know what's on the left, we don't know, we don't know the launch angle, if we, we could assume that it's the same as the impact angle, so whatever 90 minus theta is, we might assume that. It's not necessarily true. Plus, this is being shot above ground, and it, the angle is at ground, so you know they're not the same in that regard, unless the archer is laying on their back uh, or shooting from a hole or something, which we were not told uh, that. So any physics problem, it's a good idea to draw picture, label as many things as you can. And in this process, see, nobody would have thought that the components were flipped at the impact angle, and you may not even have thought to analyze the impact angle. So it's just the slow uh, methodical approach alerts you to things that you would easily miss, uh, especially if you're thinking that, oh, there's just some simple equation and I'm done. And so sometimes that's true, not on this one. So the other thing I'd hope you would remember from all of the note-taking and blabbing and whatnot about projectile motion is that it has two independent parts. It has a horizontal part and a vertical part. So it would be worth uh, taking uh, those one at a time because that's the way you do it. Uh, so I want to analyze the horizontal velocity part. So here's the thing about 
if you there you have the first zeroth law, second zeroth law, and the combined zeroth law. The combined zeroth law is called the combined zeroth law because it literally addresses both. Uh, first zeroth law doesn't deal with acceleration. Second zeroth law does. So if I use the combined zeroth law, it when in doubt, you could write the combined zeroth law, and for horizontal that means x, which that so the displacement of x would be the x velocity delta t plus one half acceleration in the x direction delta t. Now I'm being very um, explicit here. Since I'm dealing with x here, it must mean that I'm dealing with x there. If it was a y displacement, then it would be vy and a sub y, which a sub y would be little g in this case. And if it was z, it would be whatever's true in the z direction. Generally speaking, there's only acceleration in the y direction, uh, unless you're talking about wind or something else, which we're not doing. Okay. So since this is horizontal uh, motion, this whole term just goes to zero because it's not being accelerated in the x direction. So once something, the force is done, that change of momentum's done, then it just has a speed. And if there's no force acting on it, there's no acceleration. In reality, there is an air drag force. We're not dealing with that yet. That's next week and beyond. For now, we assume that everything's perfect when it's technically not. So we can learn the easy part of the analysis. So really, you just end up with the first zeroth law because you you acknowledge that there's no acceleration. You could have just gone straight to the first zeroth law and you would have been right, but why? Okay, and you would have, might have just been lucky with that. The other thing to remember is that uh, Vx is the initial velocity times the sine of theta. Okay, so this little uh, thing is true here. And so this means that delta x uh, equals v naught sine theta delta t because uh, vx is this is this. So you still have that delta t, you still have that delta x. All right? So we wouldn't normally think to do that about horizontal velocity, but here's the nice thing. Uh, because, well, one, if anything, we put cosine because it's horizontal, okay, instead of the other way. And so you could solve this for v naught. What is, what is v naught? So this, this problem, is there's a lot of ways that you can mess it up because it's the math. So you might want to save it uh, till last when you're doing the, the test. I think you can do them, see them all at once. I don't think it, um, so I give that because, you know, it's a warning. You can judge your time. So the y velocity. Uh, any final velocity is going to be what it was initially, plus, in this case, at is little g, but the initial velocity of y is zero, and why is that? Good question. Glad you asked. So think about the flight of this arrow. It's going up, 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 and it gets to the top, its peak height, and at a moment in time there, its y velocity is zero. And so now whatever final velocity it has is about that second half of the flight. It, it loses all of its y velocity going up to that peak height, and then it gets some or all of it back, maybe more if it go, falls farther than it went up. Like if it went over the edge of something, then it would pick up more speed because gravity is accelerating it. And so this equation, is looking for what was its starting point relative to y, and it wasn't the initial spot because that went to zero before it picked up speed again. Subtlety, but it's an important subtlety um, for what we're doing. And so this means that you just have vy equals gt, but vy, if you 
look up above uh, on the pink was V cos and theta. So V cos and theta equals GT. Okay, so what you can do is you can find T and then you can use uh, V naught from equation two to finish it off. Okay, so um, that one is a bit of a challenge. I expect to be helping people along on their second or third try of that. Um, and again, make sure that you turn in written work, scan it to PDF and add it at the end so that I can give you partial credit uh, for giving that a good college try, so to speak. Might even make it an extra credit, we'll see. All right, good old Galileo. Uh, so movie consultant, I want to make this realistic for the physics part so that people aren't giving us grief online in forums where people are too concerned about that sort of thing. Um, so Galileo, you probably heard his story before the Pope locked him up, which he was lucky his best friend was the Pope. Otherwise, Galileo would have been burned at the stake for saying that the earth goes around the sun instead of the, earth, the sun, everything going around the earth. In the 1500s, I think, early 1600s, I forget when that happened, so four or five hundred years ago. Um, but his best bud was the Pope, so he got house arrest for, gosh, like 20 years or something like that, 30 years. Anyways, so he's famous for allegedly dropping two things off the Tower of Pisa and noting that they landed at different times. So that was the beginning. He preceded Newton, and then Newton took it to the next level. Uh, from the people that went before him. So uh, we want to have a movie scene that's realistic. So script calls for the rock to land 15 meter from the base. Okay, so that means I have a range of 15 meters and range is also delta X. That means, so here's a tower, you know, and so something drops off and so that means we're talking about a range of 15 meters, all right? That's the, the picture, if you will. Uh, script takes three seconds to hit the ground. So I know that delta T, we're, three seconds is our favorite uh, fall time. It's a pretty common fall time for decent sized buildings. And we also know that the uh, uh, rock leaves is hand at an angle of 30 so that means that there's a um, you know a speed uh, going in that direction so we have these pieces of information we can picture it this piece of the puzzle here means that there's you know, that V naught T range half GT squared thing at some angle. You could take that route with this problem and it would be a relatively easy problem. So here's the thing, is the range is still the range even though the range is definitely down lower on the ground because the range is how far it goes in the horizontal direction, whether it lands at the same height it was launched or not, okay? So, um, that and so basically you could take that route and it will work but also know that Vx is just delta x per delta t but Vx is always that speed and that cosine part so simpler route is probably not the displacement triangle but you could certainly go that route if you wanted to so some of these problems, it's ideal to use the triangle. Other problems, it's not. You have seen both, as far as I recall, in the assigned notes.
All right. Florida Winter League Softball. I guess that's coming up. Uh, so we have, let's see. Uh, home run over left center, 200 feet from the plate. So we, we're talking about a range of 200 feet. Uh, left fielder runs, leaps, catches the ball as it barely clears the top of a 10 foot high wall. So it's a good jump, unless she's really tall. Still a good jump, uh, if, even if she's six foot. You estimate the ball left the bat at an angle of 30 degrees. So you have all this typical projectile motion, range, height, angle sorts of problems. But it is pretty simple that delta x, we know, is just gonna be uh, V naught in the X direction, or VX rather, delta T. This is the same as range, uh, and we were given 200, so we know what delta X is, okay? But because we were given, uh, we don't know the speed, and I think this question wants us to, um, no, we're looking for time in this one. And again, in Blackboard, it asked the question that I didn't put on this handout. All right, so, but Vx is going to be V naught cosine theta delta t. Now, I want to, this right here and this right here, every physics textbook in the galaxy will just tell you that. And they'll tell you that in terms of a right triangle, uh, vectors and whatnot, that is a pre-calculus or trigonometry topic. So we're assuming that by now you've seen that, know that, remember that, etc. And it is just, um, you know, the, if, whoops, you know, if this is V, then this is VX, and that's VY, and there's some angle, so VX will be, uh, v cosine theta and vy will be v sine theta, whatever the vector. It's just that right triangle trig business that we expected you to remember from whatever course got you in the door of this one. Um, this next piece of the problem, so that we know about uh, uh, there's some y uh, directions here, and so it's caught 10 feet above where it was thrown, or hit, rather. Well, we assume uh, we weren't told how high off the ground it was when it got hit. So we just have to assume that the change in height of the ball is it's, it's 10 feet above ground. We weren't told how far above ground it was hit. Okay, so we just have to make some assumptions. But that equation, this is just the combined zeroth law uh, expanded instead of a delta y equals v naught y t, I can just say the final y uh, equals um, this. And since g is down, it's negative, instead of plus 1 half a t squared, it's minus 1 half g delta t squared. Okay, And so that equation, we would probably assume uh, that that's 0 hit from ground level, which, you know, if you think about that, you know, swinging through, maybe it's a foot or two off the ground when it gets hit. So uh, assume that it's at zero uh, for the sake of the problem. And then there, there's some uh, things to solve for. So these are, here's the setup. One and two are the setup. And number three is you would uh, use the V-naught that you could get from number one. Okay, uh, to solve for delta t, okay, in number two. And then using all the givens. And since we're talking about, um, feet 
and whatnot, then just remember that G is 32.2 feet per second per second. If we were dealing with meters, it would be 9.8 meters per second per second. And soon we'll do a lab or two that verify that metric version. Um, we've been taking it for granted up until this point, but soon we will uh, do a lab. In fact, the projectile motion lab this week, uh, the video one, We'll do that for you. And I actually demonstrated that last week, how to plot the basketball thing. And the nice thing about that one is you could use the auto um, track if you increase this frames from one to two or five per second. Uh, it'll do that. It's one of the few that will work well for that. All right. So all of this stuff is coming together. Um, Slowly but surely, it's a lot of things to, uh, to do there. So high school sports jump program interested in knee damage in the long jump, which would be an easy place to do knee damage. Uh, coach has her best long jumper demonstrate. He runs down the track at the takeoff point, jumps into the air. So now the person becomes a projectile. And so jumps into the air at an angle of 30 degrees from the horizontal. That is a cue, a modeling clue, if you will, to go, you know what? I have a projectile that had some range based on a speed that it took from the horizontal, but gravity brought it back down. So I said that and tried to draw the pieces of the puzzle at the time I was saying something. There's, there's a story to that triangle. And I just gave the shortest possible version of the story of that triangle. It's a vector triangle, V naught T plus half GT squared equals R because it's a range tail to tip, all right? And remember, the path of the projectile is always inside of the triangle, okay? Uh, and that's in my textbook explicitly and, and pretty much any textbook, all right? Since we're dealing with, again, we're dealing with feet, uh, this means that uh, G is that 32.2, okay? So just remember that. So we'll have problems... Uh, towards As we get closer to the end, we do less with feet, more with metric, but we do both because in America we still use both. So number one, uh, and again, we're going to be, uh, this model is a Sokotoa model. Rarely do you need more than two of the three trig functions. Uh, and on this one, I think you only need two. So you could find... T, and so remember, you know, sine, cosine, tangent, uh, sine of theta would be half gt squared over r. Either things cancel out to where you can solve for one thing or not. Cosine of theta would just be adjacent over hypotenuse. Uh, tangent of theta, opposite over adjacent. So two of those three things will be what you use. You'll use one of those to find T. One of those is an easy kill for T with the givens, okay? And so you can, uh, so the degrees are given. The range is given. And so it seems to me that, you know, there's one of these functions that would let you go straight for time. In fact, only one of them leaves you with one unknown, namely time. Okay? So uh, you can figure that out. And then after you get that, you want to find V. 
And of course, once you find T, you can update that and then use it for, then I think uh, uh, two of the remaining, either one of the remaining ones would let you go for um, uh, V naught rather, I guess, uh, once you have the time. And so um, a simple problem if you use the model in a methodical way. All right, last problem in the setup for uh, your level three test this week. So summer job insurance company, some tragic accident. So there was a hill, a short flat spot before the big cliff, and then it landed. So let's, a hill with a slope of 10 degrees. So it always pays to draw a nice picture. There is a vertical drop of 400 feet. So we could say uh, H equals 400 feet, like that. Um, Where a car, I'm going to switch colors here, where a car is wrecked 30 feet from the base of the cliff. So we could have, uh, you know, a range of 30 feet. All right. We know that the car is going to leave at some initial speed from this flat spot. And I've sort of exaggerated this flat spot, there's a, uh, a very short distance becoming a parking lot over it. So that's what this is. We're not told how long it is. We assume it's short enough so it doesn't lose much speed. So the car is going to be coming down the hill. Gravity is what's making it run away, plus its engine, I guess. All right, was this just a... Uh... Driver fell asleep, drove off the road. Um, and then they're heading down it. But as soon as it hits that flat, the only thing that would keep it moving is its momentum or any additional force. So it comes off of there at some speed. It's a lot of information that we don't know, don't need to know uh, for the sake of what this question asks of us, okay? And so uh, was it possible that the driver fell asleep at the wheel and drove off the cliff? Calculate the speed of the car as it left the top of the cliff. And so, you know, to, will this thing go 30 feet with a time of flight associated with um, this. So remember, if you know H, you know that that's equal to half GT squared. You don't even need the, four, the displacement triangle. It wouldn't matter how, the, the car could be going the speed of light, okay? Well, there'd be some interesting relativistic effects. So say it was going a thousand miles an hour off the cliff. It's impossible, unless without a rocket pack. It would still fall at the same time. It would just land farther away because it would have more displacement in the horizontal during that time. So the time of flight's a time of flight regardless of how fast it's going off the cliff horizontally. And that's the nice thing. If it was going at any angle other than zero, this problem would be more complicated. We would need the, for the uh, displacement triangle. So I think we've drawn pretty much all that the given information. So this is just modeling uh, the situation. Modeling. I always want to put two L's. I'll skip that this time. I don't know why I want to do that or even if it's right. So we're just modeling the situation here. So we, and the nice thing about that is we find that, ah, here's a nice, I can extract a piece of information. I can know the time of flight uh, right off the bat. And so there's the fact that I, one half g t squared, t equals what? I can go straight to that. There is the fact that v is still delta x per delta t, which is r per delta t. 
I know R, I can find T, I can find that speed, okay? Uh, v naught it would be in this case. There's really nothing else uh, to the problem. So the thing that will help when you're doing the math is you might want to start by writing out exactly what I wrote out and then finishing it. And at least that will make it easier to see where uh, any mistake that followed that uh, shows up. And so some, most people turned in notes with the last one. Some people didn't, and I, so I wasn't able to give them any points back or give them any advice about solving uh, the problem. So uh, show your work, whether it's mine or yours, uh, show your work.